All right, so what is abstract algebra? That's kind of what we got a chance to scratch the surface of in our first class meeting today. So we started out by just brainstorming what is it that we understand algebra to be when we're sort of math students coming up through the grades. Um, and some of the ideas that you had was that algebra is about things like equations and various other theories that help us to take arithmetic that we grow up being accustomed to and extend it out into new uh, environments and let us solve new problems with arithmetic. In particular, solve problems involving unknowns, right? So variables show up and that's how you know that it's algebra uh, when you're coming up through school. Same thing with graphing in the way that we usually think of graphs of functions, right? Um, and at its heart, algebra is somehow about operations, but so is arithmetic, right? The operations of addition and subtraction, multiplication, division, exponents, radicals, those operations define what it means to study arithmetic. In the context that we study it with the number systems that we study it coming up through the grades, the integers followed by the rational numbers followed by the real numbers. Um, and in every case, the goal of these operations is to take two of those numbers or one of those numbers or three of those numbers or whatever, take some collection of those numbers and produce another number out of it. That's what we mean by an operation. Um, but algebra, as we want to understand it, is about taking those ideas and broadening them out, finding out what is the what is at the heart of what makes those systems that we take for granted work so well. So it's about finding more general cases, where maybe the operations are not the familiar arithmetic operations that we're used to, and maybe the objects that we use are no longer numbers in the number systems that we're used to, but are something else altogether. And so my goal in this first class was to give us an experience of thinking in that way about algebra that doesn't involve numbers and that doesn't involve the traditional arithmetic that we do with numbers. And so that's why we did the rational tangle dance on day one. In the rational tangle dance, we start out with two horizontal ropes and four people holding those ropes at the vertices of a rectangle, and then conduct the dance by iteratively either rotating, where everybody takes one step to the right, or twisting, where the top right twists over the bottom left. And you can imagine that the more of those steps that we do, the more these ropes are going to get tangled in with one another and create what's called a rational tangle. The theory of rational tangles was developed by John Conway uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, and it turns out to be this really useful object for getting into studying what we call knot theory in math. So I had you all do the rational tangle dance, come up with a, a series of T's and R's, a series of swaps and rotates that will create a tangle, uh, and then we sort of went from there. So the first group came up with this dance of T's and R's, TRT, TRT, TRTT. And what we observed together as they were doing this dance in front of the classroom is that by the time they got to step three, the rational tangle in their hands was back to step zero. So TRT left us back with an empty tangle again. And then it happened again and it happened a third time. And so the net result of this first dance was just a tangle that was a single twist, which at the end of the day is not a very interesting tangle. Right? It's just got this one little crossing in it, even after doing 10 steps. The next group fared even worse, in a sense, sorry, um, that at the end of their dance, they ended up with an empty tangle. They ended up right back where they started, even though in the interim they had done 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 dance steps uh, along the way. Uh, so it wasn't until the third group that we ended up getting something that looked well and truly tangled at the end of the day. So here was their dance step. Three twists followed by a rotation, two twists followed by two rotations, one twist followed by three rotations. And at the end of that process, their tangle looked like this. Okay. And so, of course, the fun part of the rational tangle dance was that we were then able to take and wrap this tangle up inside of an envelope. And then I did a little scratch work and was able to tell the group, all right, continue twisting and rotating in this particular sequence. And at the end of that whole process, what resulted was again an empty tangle. So what the group was able to create in this series of 12 dance steps, I was able to uncreate using this series of 11 of the same kinds of dance steps. The same twists and the same rotations every time were able to somehow untangle this nasty looking tangle. So that we did with group three. Group four came up and their tangle ended up looking like this which is unremarkable from a tangle perspective because it's just kind of five twists in sequence, but they're vertical twists. And so the question I asked at this point was, all right, why, why are these tangles hard to untangle? Is there something else we could do that could make our life easier? 
And there's sort of two answers to that question. One is that, well, it would be nice if we could undo the rotation, the, the counterclockwise rotation. But the observation that one of you made at that point was that it is possible, in fact, to undo a rotation uh, in this structure. If I want to rotate the opposite way 90 degrees, I can instead rotate the same way 90 degrees, just done three times, right? Rotating clockwise by 90 degrees is the same as rotating counterclockwise by 270, which is the same as three successive rotations in the direction of our rotation r. So the opposite of a rotation is the same as three consecutive rotations. And there's a couple ways we could write that to express it as an equation to make it look like algebra. One is to think about additive notation. So to denote the opposite rotation as the additive inverse, minus r, and then denote the, the result of three successive rotations, r plus r plus r, if you like, as 3r. That's one way we could express this, using additive lingo. We could also use multiplication lingo. And for multiplication, the multiplicative inverse is something that we often call, in, when we're working with numbers, a reciprocal, 1 over r, right, instead of minus r, thinking about multiplicative inverse. But this sort of requires us to have division be something that we can take for granted as being a thing. Uh, so very often in abstract algebra, instead of writing 1 over r, we'll write r to the power minus 1. And if we're using multiplication lingo, uh, we would also say that the result of rotating three times would now be thought of as r times r times r. So we'd write that as r to the power 3. So here are some algebraic ways that we can sort of encode this observation that we made, that rotating the opposite direction is possible. It's just the same thing as rotating three times in the same direction. So undoing rotation doesn't seem to be the issue. Undoing twists seems to be the issue. Because if that were simple to do, all we'd have to do to untangle this tangle is just rotate it either clockwise or counterclockwise, really, by 90 degrees to make the twists horizontal. And then we can just undo the twists, like undoing a twist tie in a bread bag, right? But we don't have an untwist in our system. So it's not at all obvious whether it should even be possible to untangle this tangle. But of course, the magic of the rational tangle dance is that we put that tangle in an envelope anyway, and then came up with what turned out to be a sequence of 13 dance maneuvers that we needed to do that ended up at the end untangling this tangle anyway. So this, to me, is a really interesting way to begin thinking about what abstract algebra is. We have this system of operations where we can take t's and r's and we can combine them together in a way that we can realize physically as a twisting of ropes. But that somehow there's enough relationships among the, the t's and the r's that allow us, seemingly, to be able to, with the same t and r objects, both tangle up the ropes and also untangle those same ropes. And that's somehow a surprise. So what I'd like for you to do between now and our next meeting is to think about what, what to make of this exercise? In what sense is this algebra? So here are some specific discussion questions. First of all, just what did you notice uh, on the process of doing the, the rational tangled dance? What else does it make you wonder? This is one of the most powerful things we can do as mathematicians, is to wonder and make conjectures and, and, and predictions about something. That's where theorems come from. Every theorem begins its life as a conjecture. Um, were there any surprises about how this process all worked? Can you write an equation? And we kind of did it here in the previous slide. Can you write an equation to describe what happened in this rational tangle dance? An equation that has t's and r's in it. Um, and the most interesting question, I think, is this third question. What is it that you're able to say, after having done this, about how t and r exist as algebraic objects? What kind of properties do t and r, and the operation of gluing them together, have? For example, uh, does a commutative property uh, hold for this operation? How about the associative property? If you have a couple of, of strings, you can sort of try making tangles of your own and investigate these questions. Um, in what sense can we say that t and r have inverses? I mean, we talked in this class about how r has an inverse, but what about t? Can we write down an inverse for t? What does an untwist actually look like? So chat about these, get into the class discussion channel, and, and give some ideas. We're going to start our next class by building off of this observation.